Pedro, and welcome to the show this morning. The topic this morning is Tennessee State University, and we're fortunate to have with us the president of Tennessee State University. And of course, uh, Dr. Glover, let me uh, welcome you uh, to Thank the uh, show you. this morning and uh, to remind our audience uh, that your name is Dr. Glender Glover, uh, yes. the president of Tennessee State University. And uh, we might say that uh, you've uh, been a very, very active president at Tennessee State University, and some of our uh, audience have uh, asked for you on many times since you've been here and uh, we're just glad to have you here now and so that uh, they'll know that uh, we made an attempt to bring Dr. <laughs> Linda Glover to our television show and uh, she is she, she simply represents uh, the uh, latest of all of the presidents that our audience has had an opportunity to meet on this particular show and so we're just glad to uh, have you here. Uh, Dr. Glover before we start let's uh, see if we can give our audience some uh, background information of uh, your background uh, your education and some of your experiences before you got to Tennessee State University and then after that we'll have a break and then we'll come back and deal well, with some of the aspects. Certainly, thank you very much. It's an honor to have a conversation with you. I always enjoy speaking about Tennessee State University. It has become my favorite subject <laughs> in the last two years. Uh, my background, I grew up, was born and reared in Memphis, mm -hmm. attended public schools in Memphis, Tennessee State undergraduate. Uh, finished in 1974. It's just a real honor and a real blessing to come back to uh, the very grounds, the foundation that gave me my start to now come back in such a wonderful leadership position. It's just an awesome, awesome experience. But on the way to Tennessee State, of course, I, I went back and got um, a master's degree from Clark Atlanta, and a doctorate from George Washington, and a law degree from Georgetown. Mm -hmm. and. Um, my background also is an accountant. Uh, I'm, as a professional, I'm an accountant by profession, uh, CPA. And uh, so you, we need all of those skills into one to come back now to TSU as the president. And thinking in terms, Dr. Glover, of coming to uh, Tennessee State University and your first experience coming as a, uh, a student to Tennessee State University, what did you know about Tennessee State University before you arrived here? And, uh, certainly not knowing that one day you would be the president of Tennessee State University, but what were some of your thoughts in terms of the opportunities that you felt that you might have had? Well, as a student, um, math, I was a math major, and I wanted to be in the honors program, so I graduated with honors and just had a lot of experiences with the honors students and the types of opportunities that a school like TSU offered. I spoke with various uh, companies, mm -hmm. I never thought about teaching, really, because I was so interested in going into the corporate world. Uh, higher education came later on in my career, but most of my experiences were uh, public speaking, <laughs> dancing, doing things that students do on campus, uh, being involved with the panel and the council, those types of, of, of activities. So you arrived at Tennessee State University as a freshman student in, in what year? And give us some an, an idea in terms of your impression about Tennessee State University. Oh, University. I loved it at first sight. I got there, you know, students make decisions based on uh, some form of academic programs. Uh, I want to major in math. It wasn't so much a math program. It was uh, the, the individuals that I knew went, had attended Tennessee State and had done so well in their careers and were influencing me. And it was, it was excitement mm -hmm. about having been uh, a student at TSU and they came back to my church and my community and they talked it up so I said well let me just go and see what they're talking about and then my parents um, could not afford to send me out of state to somewhere else so I had some limited options at that time and I chose TSU because I saw what it offered both educationally, uh, socially, the versatility that was there. I just enjoyed it all. And so you landed at Tennessee State University as a freshman student in what year, uh, Dr. Glove? Seven to one. Now, who was the president of Tennessee State University at that particular time? Um, Dr. Torrance. Uh, Dr. Torrance. Torrance, and, and, yes. And, so, so what did you think about Dr. Torrance and the uh, faculty that you met at Tennessee State University? Well, the faculty was so caring and nourishing, mm -hmm. I mean, nurturing. And Dr. Torrance was uh, very accessible. He would, we would, he would sit and talk with students in the cafeteria. He was very... Um, he was easy to speak with and he was always around. He, he wanted to do something that may not have been 
so uh, acceptable by the standards of the, of the faculty. He was there. You look up and he was standing right there. So he was always there. Very good. So. And so, Dr. Glover, we're going to take our first commercial break and we're going to come back and deal with some other aspects of your uh, journey at Tennessee State University. And we'll be back Thank with you. our audience following this very, very short commercial break. Thank you and welcome back to the second segment of the show for today. We're talking to Dr. Glenda Glover, the uh, president of Tennessee State University, and she's given us some information in reference to her background, education, and experiences. And now she will talk about uh, coming to Tennessee State University. Some of the individuals that she met at Tennessee State University had influence upon her and how she was able to uh, achieve academically uh, at the uh, institution at a time when many people felt that uh, these kinds of institutions were not doing what they ought to do. Talk about it from that perspective. Well, Dr. from Love. an HBCU perspective, uh, the first thing I had to decide was, am I going to attend HBCU, yes or no? So I made that decision that I wanted to attend HBCU, Historical Black College, and then Tennessee State rose to the top of the list. And then coming here, I met so many wonderful individuals, the faculty, staff, of course, um, the, the, I have five that, I, that always come to mind. Of course, two are deceased now, the two Gassaway sisters, Dr. Dr. Sadie Gassaway, Dr. Perilla Gassaway, but um, the Williams, Mac, Dr. McDonald Williams and Jamie Williams. They've they both been in that seat. Go yes, they mm -hmm. now live in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And they were so tremendously influential in my life, in my career. I called them as I was doing my inaugural address. I called her and had her assist me with doing some research on it. So they, I still talk to them quite, um, quite frequently. In fact, their daughter-in-law is one of my close friends. And of course, Barbara Merle was there as uh, she was the vice president, the first vice president female in the whole system, the TSU, the TBR, Tennessee Board of Regents system. So she's become, a, she was a close friend of mine too. So those were some of the folk who were influential mm -hmm. while I was at TSU and is that who are still living and having fun, mm -hmm. not about to do anything, they're not even sick at all. Mm -hmm. So those were some of the wonderful mentors that, um, that are very, very influential to me. Have you thought about uh, being the president of Tennessee State University now and uh, uh, sort of incorporating some of the things that you learned uh, under their leadership in reference to dealing with uh, faculty and staff and students now? Has that had any impression on you at all? Well, the fairness, the fairness aspects. Uh, you know, you pick up in the fairness and you want to make sure you operate with a strong sense of integrity at all times. Well, I noticed that they're just there was an element of fairness about um, Dr. McDonald Williams and our honors programs classes, and um, it was no nonsense. You know, he was so. The those are the kind of things, the strict, the strict love that you know, some folks call it tough love, but there's a strictness that you apply as you love and mentor students. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I saw that then, and I see it now in many of the faculty that we have, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, it's, and it's very encouraging in terms of being able to replicate that kind of attitude that they had toward your students now. It is, and then you apply the, some of the, your own characteristics and traits that you've picked up you know, in the business world, you know, being a CPA and being a lawyer uh, and an educator, those three work so well together as you at the top leadership position because you, you, you see things with a bigger picture in mind, and you can, you're able to dissect mentally much quicker. Mm -hmm. So, and I find myself 
analyzing um, the smallest, <laughs> the smallest sentence that's brought to me when it, when it comes to finances. Mm -hmm. So that is very important because, as you know, many of our universities are looking for additional funds. Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure you can quickly make decisions mm -hmm. about how to best employ the funds that we have. And you think that uh, the very fact of you being an accountant as well as a lawyer helped to enhance uh, your ability to be able to deal with some of the problems oh, absolutely. that you... Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. As an auditor, I know that most problems are not so much uh, from breaking the law or misappropriating or doing uh, inappropriate, acting in an inappropriate manner, mm -hmm. is not knowing the rules in the first place. Mm -hmm. I think the legal profession has uh, made me learn how to read mm -hmm. rules and laws more closely and understand them much better. Mm -hmm. And of course, the accounting profession, uh, which is the language of business, so it, because it made me understand business mm -hmm. and the business aspects of being a president. Mm -hmm. And so all of those things really came together uh, for you uh, coming to Tennessee State University as the uh, president of Tennessee State University. What did you think in terms of uh, 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 first being uh, uh, selected and, and mm -hmm. then finally, uh, finally selected as president of United uh, uh, Tennessee State <laughs> University uh, of the United States. You, that you might stand there, but but what did you think in terms of when that happened to you? That it was so much excitement uh, in my family because we had it was a process that took I, I would say about two or three months, mm -hmm. going through the interviews and and meeting various people and getting feedback from the campus, the students, uh, the Board of Regents who ultimately made the made the, the selection and the, took the vote. So I was very pleased and honored to come back now and lead the university that gave me my start. I mean, there is just, there's no greater honor, no mm -hmm. greater blessing than when God calls you back home. Mm -hmm. And there you were at Tennessee State University, <laughs> selected as the president of that great institution now to move that institution forward. And you are moving the institution forward uh, according to everything that we see in the, in the uh, newspaper and everywhere else. That, and, and, and when we come back, when we have our second commercial break, what we'd like for you to do is to think in terms of uh, how you are moving the uh, university. That is, some of the Definitely. principles that you've laid down and you, we might, uh, I think in some instances, refer to them, them as challenges and opportunities sure. and recognizing that. And that's what we want to uh, talk about. I think that I've heard you on many occasions lay out five or six points in terms sure. of what you're trying to do in terms of enrollment and et cetera, yes. et cetera. And so that's, you know, I think that our audience would be uh, really concerned in terms of hearing that kind of information and about how you are working hard in a real sense to make sure that uh, students have an opportunities, even those students who somehow might <coughs> not have been doing the things that they ought to do to have that opportunity, but exactly. there you are. Yeah, and, and I think that uh, the uh, community is aware of all of the things, and I want you to and talk about so. that, you Thank see, you. because yeah. I think that that plays a very, very significant role in terms of how you are able to uh, deal with the uh, university as well as how you're able to deal with outside of the university, because I think that we've seen uh, in the newspaper a lot of information in reference to who you are and about the uh, not only the groundbreaking activities that you're involved in uh, for historically black institutions, uh, black females, and et cetera, and et cetera, and you are indeed a role model. But thank you and very so much. And so I want you to just jump into that uh, when we come back and talk about your background, I mean, your uh, challenges and, and some of your opportunities. Certainly. We'll do that in about 10 or 15 seconds, and then we'll be able to sort of tie this up for the day. But I do want you to talk about uh, some of the things that you talk about every day in terms of dealing with your <laughs> faculty, staff, and the uh, institution itself. And of course, we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short uh, commercial break.
Thank you and welcome back to the final segment of the show for today. We're talking to Dr. Glover, the uh, president of Tennessee State University, and she's given us some information in reference to her background, education, and some of her experiences coming to Tennessee State University. And now she's going to talk about some of the challenges and some of the opportunities that she has uh, in terms of uh, meeting uh, some of those challenges and opportunities. Uh, Dr. Glover, let's pick up where we left off uh, before we head our second yes. commercial break. I was telling you how um, pleased and just uh, appreciative I am to the Nashville community for being so receptive and so supportive of the endeavors of TSU. We have we put together a five point plan to increase the our graduation rates for our students. That's our number one priority now is to make sure that our students receive the support and the opportunity to graduate. Students have start have a right to graduate. So we are putting in uh, procedures and implement various activities to ensure retention mm -hmm. and so that students will have the opportunity to graduate. Because the new model now is not the number of students that you have. Of course, it's, that's important because tuition revenue is always important. But the number of students that, who graduate, now funding is based on students who graduate. It's performance based now. So that's very, very important. And then we're looking also at fundraising in making partnership with the business community. We've made about 100 partnerships over the last year. And some have resulted in financial resources, some other resources. We have anonymous contributions that have come in. So we, we have really been hitting that ground, running, beating the bushes to meet the, the corporate community, to partner with them, to show them that we have the students, you know, you know, our partnership is based on students and the expertise of our faculty, and hopefully that you will respond with sponsorships and partnerships with us. Mm -hmm. So that's been a, that's been a fun, <laughs> fun game for us for a year now. And so that's quite a, quite a bit of activity that you've become involved in in terms of fundraising. Uh, I think I heard you say at one time that uh, you uh, really almost have to uh, support uh, Tennessee State University from private money as well as state money because you don't receive as much money you think as, uh, yeah. uh, as a matter of fact, none of our institutions. I that's, think that that's that's has correct. always been the uh, charge, uh, not charge, but one of the challenges this was that pr uh, presidents have had to face. Absolutely. Most people are surprised when they hear that we receive less than a third mm -hmm. of our funding from the state of Tennessee, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. and the rest, we, because of tuition revenue, government grants, you know, we mm -hmm. private funds, but we find a way to raise the funds mm -hmm. to keep the school going. But it, it's largely tuition driven. Um, so the base, the out-of-state fees, the in-state mm -hmm. fees, all that makes for our entire budget. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in, in terms of uh, <coughs> the uh, kind of assistance that, uh, because I've had a number of individuals on this show from Tennessee State University, and they've talked about uh, the kind of assistance that they are able to uh, receive through grants and some of the things that have happened dealing with the uh, national administration in terms of opening up yes, funds. And yes. et Has Tennessee State University received any of those funds in reference to that? Well, we write a lot of grants, and yes, to date, I would say we received almost 40 million in funding from the federal government, the federal and state government, largely federal. Mm -hmm. And we, we spent a lot of time on the Hill in, in D.C., mm -hmm. talking to the various agencies, mm -hmm. agriculture, treasury, health. We're, we're talking to them, partnering with them to present the new programs that we have, the flagship programs, and the expertise of the faculty and staff so that they will feel comfortable partnering with us and, and know that if they do, bring us on as one of their partners and they can sleep at night knowing that we'll get the job done. I think one thing that is noticeable that there are a number of buildings that are going up on uh, the campus at Tennessee State University. Why don't you make some statements in reference to all of that activity that's happening in the agricultural area and some of those other yes, we, buildings, that big fine uh, athletic uh, facility that you've got there. Why don't you make yeah, some we statements? Yeah, we have a, a new, that was the athletic, uh, the athletic building the indoor-outdoor facility, practice facility. We also just, we're gonna have a uh, ribbon cutting probably next month, on, well, probably April, this is still February, on the, um, the new agricultural building that, we just, that was just finished. So that was funded by USDA. So we're really proud of that. And we're looking at some more buildings down the road, a new nursing building. Uh, this is, as, as oddly enough, 
or thankfully enough, this is TSU's time on the funding cycle. It comes around every nine or 10 years. So this is the year that TSU receives funding. Uh, so we're on the schedule of this, uh, it'll probably end up being next year, but we're looking at a new nursing facility and perhaps another part of our education building to house a new STEM program, an education STEM program where we train teachers to teach students about math and science in third, fourth, and fifth grade. So we're, we're really excited about mm -hmm. that. That STEM program, I've heard a lot about that program and engineering and all of yes. all these other activities and the idea as to what increased the number of graduates in these yeah, areas. We want to, the whole STEM initiative across the country mm -hmm. is to increase the number of African American graduates in the sciences and technology and engineering and math mm -hmm. because that number is woefully low. And with the, the, the added emphasis from the President Obama on down to the, the, the high schools, we're trying to emphasize the STEM areas to get the analytical thinking, the strategic thinking, the thought processes to help as we uh, increase our national scores on exams. Uh, Tennessee recently was, was rated the most improved state in K through 12. So that was very, very impressive, very phenomenal for Tennessee. And we were pleased to quote that statistic everywhere. But we're looking at how can we as TSU help to improve the education status of our state and of course our country. Where there's an education crisis across the country, there's, there's no secret. So we, we believe teaching STEM and math early, uh, and with training teachers on how to teach STEM, uh, uh, math and science very early it's one of the ways to, uh, to assist us. And then going to a common core curriculum where those standards will assist us in getting uh, our students what they need uh, as far as the, uh, developing the, the, the types of the knowledge and the skill set, the basis they will need to know. So we're, we're excited about some of the new um, paradigms that's coming about in, in education, K through 12, that will feed into higher education. You know, uh, there's one question that I always raise whenever we have a person from a Tennessee State University, and that has to do with the lottery funds. Do you, are you receiving any of that uh, lottery money uh, from the uh, state? Well, I mean, from the lottery? No, none to speak of. Uh, you're, not, you're not receiving <laughs> enough of it, I would imagine. Yeah, I'm not sure if we're receiving any of it. Uh -huh. so, I mean, it's, if it's not enough to speak of and make a point about. Uh -huh. Very good. Oh, well, I can, I can certainly appreciate that. Uh, so, and, and so in a real sense, you, you're sort of optimistic in terms of the possibilities that, uh, that you face in terms of bringing more resources. Oh, it's in unimaginable. Mm -hmm. We have, we, we, we made so many partnerships and we're, we're talking to more companies by becoming engaged mm -hmm. and understanding what TSU offers. And, especially in the Nashville and Davidson County area, because we are, TSU belongs to all of us. It belongs to, to Nashville, it belongs to the state of Tennessee. It belongs to you and me, it belongs to all of us. So we're selling TSU to the community, that we're no longer this, this university that's, that's on the hill in North Nashville. We're, we're out there meeting the needs of the business community. What they need, what the business community needs from Tennessee State is to be a fine academic partner and produce ready to employ graduates. And that's what we're, we're striving to do. And you've got a nationally known uh, uh, education school program and uh, engineering program and nursing program and et cetera. And so you're really ready to uh, move forward. And that's true. When people say, what is your flagship program? I you know I have to brag and say there are flagships. I mean, the engineering, uh, health sciences, agriculture, business, mm -hmm. liberalized, we have, there are so many flagships mm -hmm. until it, it's difficult to say that you can single out one or two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you're just, you, you're really excited, uh, Dr. Lovely. I'm appears. excited, the alumni, I'm, I'm so excited about the excitement that's around me. Uh, I'm going to visit many of the alumni chapters mm -hmm. and that excitement is rubbed off. I gave them a challenge to meet a $50,000 challenge and they, some of them already met that challenge. Others are striving hard to do it. They're having fundraisers because we're raising money through the mm -hmm. Alumni Association. And, 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 and so you, you, you're really actively involved in terms of moving Tennessee State University forward in, uh, in terms of trying to find the resources and bring the students in and, and, and serve a real uh, a need for the state of Tennessee. Is that so that's the entire idea. That's what exactly what we're trying to do. That's our, that's, that's our ultimate goal. Very good. Thank you and, very much. And, and of course, let me thank you for coming by and giving us that information. And let me encourage our audience to tune in again next week for another informative edition of Comments. Thank you and good morning.
Thank you and welcome to the show this morning. The topic this morning is racial segregation, and we're fortunate to have with us to talk about racial segregation, Alana McLaughlin. Alana will give us some information in reference to her background, education, and her experiences, and then we'll get into the topic of racial segregation. Alana, let's uh, first of all have you to uh, talk about uh, some information in reference to uh, you and your odyssey in <laughs> reference to uh, being on this uh, television show. I think that uh, this is uh, 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 several seasons for you and uh, you started out as a, a, an eight-year-old child and now you're uh, old enough to uh, come to me and say let's talk about <laughs> racial segregation uh, and, 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 I, and I agreed with that primarily because you've done such an excellent job in terms of some of the other quote grown-up uh, topics that uh, we felt that you had to do deal with in the topics that you convinced me that you were capable of dealing with and, and so I fell for that and so I'm back again with you uh, dealing with racial segregation but before we get into racial segregation Alana let's uh, talk about uh, your background your education and some of your experiences and then we'll start talking about the topic itself well, for our new viewers, my name is Alana McLaughlin, born August 27, 2002. Um, I went to pre-K at Napier Elementary and multiple schools after that, and I currently go to uh, John Early Museum Magnet Middle School where I'm in sixth grade. Now, I'm very involved in church and other activities. Um, actually, this upcoming summer of 2014, I'm going to be attending the Junior National Young Leaders Conference in uh, Washington, D.C. <coughs> and if you're not familiar with the conference, it is basically where children all around America come together for a one week in Washington, D.C., which, which is parents free, where you just you experience Washington as a living classroom instead of being just a tourist or a resident of Washington. And so I'm very excited for that. And I'm also heavily involved in my school, church, and any activity I can really get into. Like uh, um, at school, I'm on our debate team, the student council, everything I can get into really. Um, I was previously on our step team, and I hope to be a cheerleader next year when I get into seventh grade. And in church, I am on, I'm on so, a lot of committees, uh, the United Methodist Women's Committee, um, at the Acolyte Community. Uh, committee you know the usher committee you know i just i try to help it when i can because you know i just feel like that's my duty honor very good and of course Lana, <laughs> you've been involved with a lot of things but now let's look at uh, the topic that you're dealing with today racial segregation now what, what would you say about that how, how would you approach that topic racial segregation when some when the average person would hear that they would think oh uh 19 the 1900s martin luther king marching uh, mlk uh, malcolm x type thing but then racial segregation was more than just you know the jim crow era or just african americans and uh, segregated buses or cities or anything it but it was way more than that. it expanded from just african americans europeans ukrainians germans italians because almost every race has experienced racial segregation now, the, um, going as far back in African-American culture, you would think uh, slavery. Uh, African-Americans were enslaved and made, to, uh, and made to work and beaten if they did something wrong or just beaten for their slave owner's amusement. And so that's as far back as I can previously think of for African-Americans. But then for Europeans and Ukrainians and Germans, the Holocaust or... Uh, in the f 14th and 15th century, U Europeans were segregated just like African Americans were in, our, in the 19th era. Mm -hmm. And so basically, racial segregation just expands from just African Americans to just a lot of other places like uh, mulattoes and Europeans and just all races really because at least almost all races have experienced some type of racial segregation. Very good. And so it's, it's re really general in terms of, and is that why you wanted to talk about racial separation and segregation, not only in the United States, but racial separation and segregation all over the world, because you believe it's general and it's a problem everywhere you find it. Because not a lot of people really know that, like, so I, I could hear somebody say, oh, no, white people, they didn't experience racial segregation. It was only black people when Martin Luther King had a march for us, or Rose, Rose, the Rose Park situation. It was more than that. It was almost all racist. 
And so, and, and, and so in, from that perspective, when we come back, I want you to sort of delve into uh, what you consider to be the, some of the major elements and some of the major things that uh, has to do with uh, racial segregation and ra racial separation. I think you've already indicated in a real sense that it's general and all over the world and everywhere. And, and, and I think that I can say from some of the things that you've said on this program itself, that you are now enlisting yourself into the uh, war against racial separation <laughs> and racial segregation. Because, and of course, we're going to talk about that. And we'll be back with you following this very, very short commercial break. Thank you and welcome back to the second segment of the show for today. The topic is racial separation or racial segregation and Alana has given us a taste of some of the things that she believes will play a very, very significant uh, part in terms of separating the uh, races. Let's uh, pick up from where we left off when we left, when we spoke with uh, this last uh, segment, Alana. Well, for viewers just turning in, I am indeed Alana McLaughlin, born August 27, 2002. I'm 11 years old. I am in sixth grade at John Early Museum Magnet Middle School. And in the previous segment, um, we talked about my background in education. Then we sort of got into racial segregation. Now, in the first segment, I stated that racial segregation was not only for African Americans, but it was all over. And most people don't really realize this, but it is always happening. It's still happening now. Like, um, for instance, since once I went into a shop and I looked at an, ex an expensive piece of jewelry, a necklace, and then um, a sales lady, she, um, she looked at me and she said, do you really think you can afford that? Because, I mean, I wasn't all really done up that day, you know, my hair was crazy, I, had on, I almost had on pajamas, leggings, and so basically... That sort of ra that's still it's, it's racial separation because a lot of people don't really realize that we have overcome that error and that it's no longer African Americans are poor or, and I just I don't even like that mind frame that people use nowadays. Like President Obama, we never expect well we did expect it but we never knew that we would have a black president because there are still people today who crazily think that oh black people are ghetto and that they're only good for making food or cleaning and that they're all they're all bald headed and they all listen to rap music I, I, I don't think I'm bald headed I, I, I'm, I'm fully black I have a African American mother and an African American father I, I don't think I'm bald headed I, I don't really like rap music so that's a stereotype that I don't like and then there's a stereotype about <coughs> Caucasian people who they all drink Starbucks and they're all blonde to like Instagram this social media what's that don't even get me started mm -hmm. but I just that's crazy and that's still people using this mind frame of they want to separate people like <coughs> there's still people today who think Hispanics only eat tacos or they're poor in the in a lower class it's crazy I mean because did have we not already overcome this did Martin Luther King not die for this like he didn't die for this he died so that we could all think we were all equal and that we could all be equal because we are <laughs> he didn't die for um, uh, for African American boys to, or any boy for instance to be walking down the street with their pants at their knees and <laughs> this this stereotype of the African Americans are dangerous people who carry guns and knives and all of them have weave or it's, it's crazy and I don't like it because I, um, I actually when I go down the street or when I see anything really, I always on TV is depicted as African Americans are this way or that way. 
Then there are the African Americans who think that they're higher than people, and I just think that we're all equal. We're all we're all one, basically. We're all made in the image of God. I don't think that she's higher than him or he's higher than her. The highest up would be God to me, and I may be wrong, but I don't think I am. <laughs> and so basically, I just want us to all be equal because we are, and I wish people would see that. Like I. I am sick and tired of going on Facebook and seeing someone so say, I saw this girl, she got robbed today by this black girl, and just cut the black out of it, okay? Cut, okay, that black part did not need to be added, okay? She got robbed, okay? That could happen anywhere. Uh, a Hispanic girl could have robbed her, a white girl could have robbed her, a black girl could have robbed her. What, what is it about African Americans, uh, African Americans that make people think, that we're all so dangerous, that we all love fried chicken and Kool-Aid. And this is stuff that I've seen on the internet. I once read a, a blog a blog post on Tumblr that said that African Americans' favorite food, that their favorite meal, was Kool-Aid and fried chicken. That is the most stereotypical racist thing I have ever read in my life, besides reading uh, some of these U.S. Supreme Court cases. And now back to, ra oh. yeah. Yeah. Now back to racial segregation, because I kind of got off topic. Now, see, as I said in the first segment, that the uh, early sign of racial segregation was slavery. Now, if, if you're not familiar with slavery, sl slavery was when African Americans were enslaved by Caucasians or people of different races. I'm not going to single white, pe white people out. But then they were um, enslaved by different races and made to work and clean and cook because that other races thought they were higher up on a uh, financial or on just a regular scale than us African Americans or us people of different races. And so they thought that, hey, we can abuse them and we can batter them and we can just kick them around for our own amusement because at the time that was something funny. And now see, when I look back at this, I still see people who think that we're in slavery days. I still see people in, in my own, uh, not in my community, but like in my own little bubble of world in the places I go. I still see people who think that black people aren't good for anything. And this is stuff that I see on social media, on Facebook, uh, Vine and stuff. And then people want to make jokes out of it and it's not funny. I mean, like that would be like you going up to a, a Jewish person and drawing a swastika on your hand and saying, ha 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 ha, you're in the Holocaust. Like, that's not funny. You, you don't joke about that stuff because that's just not funny, basically. And so I'm just trying to get the word out and just tell people that, hey, I mean, just let's move forward instead of going back into the past. I mean, yes, we have to learn about the past to make the future. Like, I, I wouldn't be precious right now if I didn't know about Martin Luther King and his struggles and Malcolm X and all. But I still say, it, let's just not recreate the past because not all of it was pretty beautiful. So how about we recreate a future where we all think we're equal and we love our neighbor instead of, you know, just hating people and thinking that we're better than people because we're all equal. Nobody's better than anybody. Nobody's just, we're equal. We're all people. We're all made with the same things. We, all, we almost all have hair and eyes. We just, we're all humans. We all have souls and we're people. We're just homo sapiens. And so, Lana, in, in, in a real sense of, uh, uh, all of this information that you have in reference to racial separation and segregation, I know has to have some kind of factual basis behind it. And I think you've, been, you've talked about some of the factual basis of the beginning of racial separation and et cetera, and et cetera. And so when we, uh, we, uh, when we uh, deal with this final segment, I want you to deal with uh, some of the court cases and some of the things that made for racial separation. So in spite of everything that you've said, there was a system that separated people uh, constitutionally and uh, that's what we want to try to deal with when we come back because I think that you've got some information that can uh, give some uh, 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 credit, cre credit to those individuals who have uh, fought against some of the things that you're trying to fight against now. We can certainly appreciate that, but when we come back, let's look at uh, some of the factual information that you have dealing with uh, racial separation and ra racial segregation, and then we'll be able to, from that point on, analyze where we are going from this particular point because I think everything that you've said is exciting and etc but uh, it really does not lay, lay the foundation as to how we move forward that information that you have will deal with that and we'll be back with our audience following this very very short commercial break
Thank you and welcome back to the uh, final segment of the show for today. Uh, the topic is racial separation or racial segregation and Lana has given us uh, quite a bit of information in reference to her attitude toward equality and uh, her attitude uh, toward the separation of the races. But Lana, let's look at it a little deeper in terms of some of the other information that you have. Now, um, in the previous uh, segments, I did um, say that I was Alana McLaughlin. <laughs> I am Alana McLaughlin. Um, I am 11 years old, and I go to John Early Middle School. Now, then, in the, that was the first segment of background education. Now, in the second segment, I talked about um, how my views on racial segregation and racial, racial separation, you know, the bus boycotts and Rosa Parks' situation, and uh, uh, Dr. King and how he marched for us in, uh, in Malcolm X. Now, this last segment, um, I want to get down to a more of a factual basis because in the previous, um, in the previous um, episodes, I have more of given more of a uh, commentary basis. Now, let's talk about board versus education. Now, I think that the majority of African Americans are familiar with this uh, U.S. Supreme Court case. Now, but if you're not, I'll give you a little basis on it. The Brown versus uh, Brown versus the Board of Education was a case that basically Thank you and welcome back to the final segment of the show for today. The topic is racial separation or racial segregation and the uh, guest is Alana McLaughlin. Alana has given us some information in reference to some of the things that uh, she believed to be important in her own personal life and I think she will talk about some of the factual information in reference to separation and uh, segregation. Let's talk about it from that perspective, Alana. As Dr. Haney already stated, my name is Alana McLaughlin. I am 11 years old and I go to John Early Middle School. Now, in these past segments, I've given more of a... Uh, <coughs> a commentary based on like my opinion on and and how I feel and how I'm tied into it but now I want to get down to more of a factual basis now let's talk about the uh, Brown versus Board of Education US Supreme Court case now I think the majority of African Americans are familiar with this case but if you're not I'll give you a little basis on it the Brown versus Board of Education case was basically one-third of how we got integrated schools. Now, integrated schools are schools that have uh, multiple races in it. And before, we would have just a Caucasian school or an African-American school or this or that. But then the Brown, the, Brown versus Board, the Brown versus Board of Education case basically said, hey, what's wrong with having integrated schools? I mean, because we already see African-American kids who have Caucasian friends. Martin Luther King, for instance, he had a uh, Caucasian friend, but then he was forced to stop <coughs> meeting with his friend because he, uh, his parents thought he was in danger of a, of a Klan incident because he was friends with a Caucasian boy and he was African-American. Now, see, Integrated schools, basically. If you're familiar with like the Little Rock Nine, then you should know a lot about it. But then let me talk about the Little Rock Nine. The Little Rock Nine were a group of nine students who went to Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, who basically said, you know what, they were the, basically the first people to really join in with the Integrated Schools Act. And so that's basically how we got integrated schools. Now, Brown versus Education, as I've previously stated, mm -hmm. said that, you know, we need integrated schools. There's nothing wrong with it. And that's basically almost like 
how we got segregation in, in, ended, but then the board, Brown versus Board of Education case uh, focused more on school and education uh, as segregation uh, focused more on just daily life and um, how, how you would act if you went out to eat or uh, bus boy bu bu bus boy costumes, things like that. Now, another famous case is the, is the Plessy versus Ferguson U.S. Supreme Court case of 1980. No, 1898. Now, on June 7th, 1892, Homer A. Plessy was removed from the East Louisiana Railroad train and arrested by Detective C.C. C. Kane at the corner of Royal and Press Street for civil disobedience and violating the, the 1890 Louisiana Separate Car Act that separated railroad passengers by race. This soon inspired the Plessy versus Ferguson U.S. Supreme Court case, which stated that the um, which stated that the state law which required East Louisiana railroads to segregate trains had denied him his rights under the 13th and 14th amendments of the United States Constitution. Now, um, if you're not familiar with the Constitution, I suggest you look that up. But um, because see, I'm just going to jump right into it. Basically, this case uh, was talking about John uh, Homer Adolph Plessy versus uh, John H. Ferguson. Now, um, Homer A. Plessy, as I previously stated was taken off a, Louis a, a off a East Louisiana railroad car and um, arrested for civil disobedience because he apparently violated the 1890 Louisiana um, Railroad Car Act. Now, see, basically, he um, the people who sold him his ticket sold him the ticket um, for a whites only car, knowing his race. So basically, they set him up to fall. So personally, I think that it, uh, um, that he was not at fault for anything because he was not aware that he had had a whites only ticket until he got on the bus, and then then Detective C.C. Kane came up and said, "You're under arrest for civil disobedience." Then he finally went. Oh, they sold me a ticket for the whites only car when I'm obviously African American. Now, see, thankfully, when they took this to the U.S. Supreme Court, Homer A. Plessy was not charged as uh, they previously stated he would be, but um, he finally understood how they basically tormented and bullied him because of the fact that he was African American. Now, see, this also ties in with bullying, which has expanded to modern day uh, cyber bullying, which is bullying with, you know, electronics like this, uh, this iPhone or a computer and such. And so basically, that's one of the earliest instances on record of the U.S. Supreme, of a U.S. Supreme Court case that basically shows that th he was bullied. And so Homer a uh, Adolph Plessy, was, um, basically, he uh, got to live his life after this. He got to move forward, basically. And that's what I want to do in life. I want us African Americans, us Europeans, Germans, Italians, Creoles, I want us to move forward. Because I know that there will always be a place where we'll always have to look back and say, hey, you know, we were in slavery and that we uh, were in the Jim Crow era. But then I want us to move forward from that. I want us to uh, make an era where we get to teach our children not to um, go around with their pants hanging at their knees or to do this, to uh, make a living. But I want us, us generation, because we're going to be the future leaders, my, my generation, we're going to be the people who kids have to look up and I, I look up to. And I don't want... Uh, the future kids of the world to look up and say, hey, you know what, well, I want to be like this. I want to have a body for the t tattoos. I want to curse out everybody in my path and I want to dress like this because I want a I want a generation of classy, sophisticated people. And I'm not just saying that African Americans are um, saying that, oh, we should do this and do that. It, it's anybody. I want us to have a race of people who can be leaders, not people who um, who other people look at and say, you know, I don't even want my child around that. I don't want my child to be around to see this because I want, I want a generation where people can say, oh, I'm just so glad I raised my child like this. I don't want a generation of look at that hooligan robbing a store. And I don't want a generation of stereotypes. Now, if you're not familiar with stereotypes, you probably already know one, like the black people only eat fried chicken and drink Kool-Aid stereotype. Those are uh, types of stereotypes where people think that uh, a race does this, but really, we don't. I mean, not all African Americans like fried chicken and Kool-Aid. Not all African Americans dress like this or listen to that, because we're all unique. I mean, we're the same skin color, we're all homo sapiens, but we have different personalities because we're all different. But then, we're all the same in a... 
from a big view of a wall the same, but then from a little view, if you look at every little aspect, we're all different. And so, so Lana, if, if looking at the uh, Brown versus the Board of Education and Plessy versus Ferguson, you were able to bring some foundation in reference to separation of the races and et cetera. But in spite of all of that, you still believe that, uh, that it, it is the destiny of mankind to come together and everybody's supposed to be able to love one another and et cetera. Now, how does this leadership conference that you're getting ready to attend, how does that fit into uh, your perceptions in terms the, of um, what, uh, what Dr. Hayes referencing, referencing to is the Junior National Young Leaders Conference. Um, and that is a conference that I was nominated to attend and that I'm going to attend um, this June of 2014, this summer. Basically, the Junior National Young Leaders Conference is basically where just, you know, academically achieving kids and smart kids and just kids who have special gifts like Encore students come together and then we... Well, we don't all just sit around at a table for a whole week, and this is a week thing. We uh, go around Washington, D.C. and learn about this as our living classroom because we get to learn about our different races and our, our triumphs and all this and our tri and just all these beautiful things, and it gets to really inspire who we are. And, this, and I, I'm glad that this has been established because this is really inspiring kids to just move forward instead of just being how they see on TV or on BET. It's inspiring them to be themselves and to be a future leader. Well, Lana, do you think that many uh, children, uh, young people your age, uh, understand uh, what you're talking about in terms of separation and segregation and et cetera? And if not, uh, what would you do and what should we do in order to uh, make sure that they have a knowledge of some of the things you're talking about? I don't. I mean, because I, I, I can't go down the street and be preaching all this and have a lot of kids say, oh, my gosh, I understand how you feel. Mm, a, a major, the majority of them would look at me like I was crazy and say, are you some old lady trapped in a little girl's body? <laughs> but um, really, I, the reason I'm on here is to just get the word out, to uh, basically spread to kids my age and to people your age and to people everybody's age that, hey, I mean, if I'm a kid doing this, then you could be so-and-so doing this because this is possible. And you know what? I want to be a future leader. And so I'm trying to mold other smaller kids or maybe even bigger people to be future leaders with me. Okay, very good. And Lana, let me uh, say over the last uh, 15 or uh, 20 seconds that we have here that we certainly appreciate that information. And uh, we encourage you and encourage uh, others to uh, continue your thought in reference to this. And, of course, we'll be back with our audience next week for another informative edition of Comments. Thank, Thank you, you and good, good morning. morning.
Thank you and welcome to the show today. The topic today is from school to prison, breaking the pipeline. And we have with us to uh, talk about the topic from school to prisons and breaking the uh, white uh, pipeline, uh, Pastor Kay Walker and Pastor Kay Walker has with him today uh, Miss Rashida Fatuga and Miss Sherika Hughes, both individuals that uh, play a very, very significant role in terms of the topic that we are talking about today. And so, uh, Pastor Walker, let's start off by having you as well as Miss Hughes and Miss Fatuga give us some information about your background, your education, and some of your experiences, and then we'll be able to get into the topic perhaps by the uh, second part of this uh, show uh, dealing with uh, the efforts from pipeline, I mean from uh, school to a prison and how we might break that pipeline. Let's start off with you. Okay, Dr. Henry, first of all, let me thank you for allowing us the opportunity to come on your show and to share some information. I think it's going to be of valuable importance to your listening audience. Uh, my name is Pastor Kelvin Walker. I pastor the Hands of God Christian Church. We're located in East Nashville on North 2nd Street. I was born and raised right here in Nashville, Tennessee, attended the public schools of Tennessee, and, and amazingly enough, I thought about it on the way over here to the uh, studio here, Dr. Haney, how that, I don't know how long this prison to uh, school to prison pipeline has been in place, mm -hmm. but I know back in the 70s that uh, I was kicked out of all the metropolitan Nashville, Davidson County mm -hmm. public schools uh, for extortion. And I remember mm -hmm. the, called the principal telling me in my first year of high school, you know, that Mr. Walker, your reputation precedes you. And the first thing I did, I got kicked out of the school system totally. And of course, I fell into that trap, ended up in prison on drugs and all the whole nine yards. So, uh, but I'm here today because this is an important issue and I brought a couple of guests with me and I just want to kind of yield to them so that they can talk about it. Okay. Well, Ms. 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 Basuga, why don't you give us some information about your background, uh, education, and some of the things that were important in your life. And we will follow that with Ms. Hughes giving us basically the same kind of information and then we'll be able to go into this second segment dealing with the uh, topic uh, from prison, to, from school to a uh, prison. Okay, thank you also for having us on the show today. Um, my name is Rashida Fatuga and I'm the founder of Gideon's Army, Grassroots Army for Children, and we are a grassroots organization that's youth-led and focused on dismantling the school to prison pipeline mm -hmm. in Nashville, Tennessee. Very good. And Ms. Hughes? Um, well, my name is Masherika Hughes, mm -hmm. and I'm a student at the Academy of Old Conqueror. This mm -hmm. is my senior year, and I'm part of the Get Against Army nonprofit program for the Peace Project, help supporting youth mm -hmm. in school. And so you're part, in a real sense, part of the, pro, uh, the uh, program that uh, Ms. Patuga is talking about. Is that your? Uh, uh, yes, sir. I'm yeah. over uh, the youth in mm -hmm. school. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Pastor Walker, let's, let's look at this. Uh, idea of from school to uh, prison and, and I think that there are a large number of young people uh, many African-American youth uh, certainly who fall into that uh, trap or into that category uh, what can we say about that you know Dr. Hannon you know me I, I, I'm one that always believe that the gov our government don't always have our best, best interests at heart and especially when it comes to uh, the young African-American male and uh, especially the young African-American male in terms of wanting us to have the education that they say that they want us to have but at the same time creating all types of systems and obstacles and roadblocks that would deter us from mm -hmm. acquiring that education and, and in our school system and, and I think a lot of people are not aware of a lot of the things that take place in our school system that are systematically designed to stop uh, our people from being educated and that's why we're here today to talk about these things and, and to really make the public aware so that we can come together and effectively bust up this school to prison pipeline because they're identifying our, our young children at an, at an early age mm -hmm. and they're shuffling them through and then when you couple that with the privatization mm -hmm. of prisons here in the United States of America, it's, it's a deadly situation, it's a deadly poison that's in our society right now that has to be, uh, we have to recognize it and then not only do we have to recognize it, but we have to stand up and challenge it and fight against it and eradicate it out of our school systems. Mm -hmm. Let's see, Ms. Patuka, now you've established, we've got about a minute before the end of this segment, but you've established this organization. And make some statements about this organization before we end this segment for today, and then we'll come back and we'll pick up with uh, Ms. Hughes. But g give some statements in reference to this organization that you've established. Okay, well, Gideon's Army is working on a campaign to stop the school to prison pipeline. And what we're doing is looking at the systemic issues in our public school system, 
judicial courts, and then also just how our, our kids are handled um, as far as policing is concerned. That's, that's our focus specifically for this year. And so you think that you've got a good program that uh, can, in a real sense, at least touch this whole problem of from school to uh, prison, and that uh, that's why you wanted to uh, bring Ms. Hughes with you today, and she will be able, when we come back, to uh, give us some information in reference to her journey into this program. And yes. we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break. Thank you and welcome back to the second segment of the show for today. We're talking to Pastor Walker, uh, Ms. Fatuga, and Ms. Hughes in reference to from school to prison, breaking the uh, pipeline. Uh, Pastor Walker, I think that we've talked about uh, uh, the uh, uh, revolving door situation for a long time, but now I think the uh, idea here is what, from school to prison, and then you go in prison, and then you come back and get involved in the revolving door, Absolutely. I think, in a real sense. Uh, Ms. Hughes, let's uh, have you to uh, talk about your journey to uh, this organization that has been established by Ms. Fatuga and uh, how you feel that it uh, has helped you and those that, that, that you work with or those around you. Okay, well, I got involved in Get Against Army through my brother, which makes me passionate about it. He was murdered in 2011. He was a very troubled student, and he didn't have the opportunity to experience the things I got to experience. I was very different. I was passionate about school. I always wanted to get out, so I did everything positive that I could think of with the help of others to just get out of the neighborhood I was in, the people who were involved with it. And I had experienced something my junior year of high school, which I've never been in trouble. And soon I got in trouble. It was like everyone who helped me and supported me to be different and to experience different things, they dropped me. And I wasn't able to go to Nashville Public School anymore. And I was put in an alternative school. So it's like I was stereotyped. Like I was a bad student, but I wasn't. I was good. I did everything from the beginning to prove to everyone that I was different. And everyone knew that. So when Get Against Army came about, Rashida Fatuga, and I knew it was other students out there who were being pushed out of school, who it was their first offense, but it was zero tolerance in school. They didn't get a chance to express their feelings or how they felt. And when they fought, about how they felt and how they got in the situation, they were just looked down upon, down upon because it didn't matter because they voiced, they didn't have a voice. So joining with Get Against Army, I have been able to meet people from Vanderbilt, Fish University, TSU. So it's just like a huge diversity of people who've got in trouble, different race, it really didn't matter. And we just all got to come together and just express, express our experience of like how Get Against Army would help us or how we could help other students who've been pushed out of school. And that's really just been our main goal of helping you stay in school, staying positive, being supportive on helping them just experience different things without being stereotyped. So, so Ms. Fatuga, you established this organization, Get Against Army. Well, now, uh, what uh, prompted you, uh, what motivated you to uh, think of an organization like this and to, uh, and tell us something about the successes that you've had in reference to this organization? Okay, well, my motivation is, number one, I was a Metro Public School teacher for seven years. Uh, I taught in the Edge Hill community and I loved being in the classroom, but I, I did see as my students got older, you know, just keeping in touch with them over the years, they, they ended up being pushed out of schools. They didn't love school like they used to, incarcerated, murdered. All of these things are happening to my babies. And it, it came a point in time in looking for other 
leaders to step up and to and to do something and i realized that a lot of people have really great intentions but don't understand community organizing or haven't really done the research to know and understand what really can dismantle the prison pipeline by striking at the roots, not just dealing with little symptoms, putting out fires here and there, but what can we do to, to cut it at its, at its root? And that's been really the goal and the focus that we've had. We're a, a relatively young organization, but we've, we've done a lot. We've had a, a lot of different successes, um, and, and success, of course, is, is relative. But we've been able to build a solid base of young people at a lot of schools to do trainings. Uh, we launched the Peace Project, which is a youth-led initiative to stop violence against youth, which has been really powerful because we train the youth and then the youth train each other. And so they are empowered and, and can see also how they have control, more control over their environments and, and over their situations than a lot of times they feel. The system, it's big and it, it can also seem very overwhelming and, and like we can't do anything to, um, I don't want to say fight the system, but to correct the, the wrongs within the system or to restructure the system so that everything and everyone functions properly within it. But it's actually really doable if, if we're strategic enough. I think another big success is that we understand and we've done a lot of research um, so that we're very strategic with everything we do. And so it won't be just a lot of feel good moments and a lot of uh, just things based off of emotion. We're doing things that really work. And, and, and so Pastor Walker, in a real sense, uh, uh, you as well as they have identified this as one of the real questions that we have dealing with our young people today. This whole idea of incarceration and prison to uh, from school to prison and et cetera. Oh, absolutely, Dr. Henry. When, when you when you listen to uh, Ms. Hughes' statement, her story over there, you know, you understand. Here, you, you got a young lady that's determined to uh, go to school, do what's necessary, to do the right things, and make the grades, and 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 deliberately being different and not fitting into a certain mold and then to have one thing comes up and then to because of the zero tolerance to just be pushed completely out of the system into a whole negative environment into an alternative school sec, uh, sec, uh, section where a lot of the students in those sections some of them are trouble students mm -hmm. but to put her in that in that environment and that's to just curtail you know what she's doing so she could have easily taking that and just giving up and went into another direction caught up in drugs alcohol and all types of, mm -hmm. of, of aberrant behaviors because of that mm -hmm. you know it's, it's just by the grace of God that she had the will enough to continue mm -hmm. to pursue mm -hmm. what she had already predestined in her mind to accomplish mm -hmm. and otherwise she would have fell victim to that trap and mm -hmm. and that's what we need to talk about identify that trap mm -hmm. what is that uh, school to prison pipeline how does it work when do they identify how do they what do they do to determine what prison is going to be built in the future in, in these communities and stuff like that and so in a real sense uh, wh what we're doing here is uh, trying to uh, break that as you indicated break the uh, uh, pipeline from there and the same thing that happens after the pipeline has put them in prison they go to prison without any kind of reformation or anything and come back and then they're back to prison again. And so this is really the front end in a real sense Absolutely. of uh, this revolving door in a real sense. A Absolutely, because, you know, you're looking at our children now because of the privatization of prison in America, you're looking at children as commodities, mm -hmm. you know. So this is uh, how do we make money off of these students? Mm -hmm. And of course, we know slavery is still legal in the prison system. Mm -hmm. So if, if I can get this free labor, mm -hmm. and if I can find a way to target it, then I can, I can uh, guarantee. Very good. And of course, we're, we're going to be back with our audience following this very, very short uh, commercial break.
Thank you and welcome back to the final segment of the show for today. We're talking to Pastor Walker, Ms. Fatuga, and Ms. Hughes in reference to from uh, school to uh, prison. The pipeline is, is being broken here uh, today uh, in terms of the information that we're receiving about uh, some of the events that eventually will take uh, young people into uh, prisons, even out of the school system. And of course, Ms. Hughes, let's see if we can pick up with you, uh, because I think that you mentioned something that was very revealing in terms of how your life simply changed and whatever. And so if you don't mind, let's talk about that for, for, for a few minutes and, and have Ms. Fatuka to uh, sort of break in, I mean, to uh, bring to uh, some kind of uh, resolution in terms of why she feels that uh, what she's doing has helped you. Okay, well, as I said, my brother was murdered in 2011, and he had always had trouble with schooling. Like, the teachers didn't want him in the class. He wasn't motivated to go because he knew that he wasn't wanted. So.